Hey everyone, thank you so much for tuning in and welcome to the CDP Growth Show. I'm your host, Noah Green, and I'm here on behalf of Customer Labs. We're currently on a mission, speaking of marketers across startups, scale-ups, and hyper-growth companies to understand the rapid evolution of their MarTech stack through sharing their valuable lessons along the way. Today, I'm here with Adam Goyette, VP of Marketing at Help Scout. Thanks so much for joining me, Adam. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Noah. It's great to have you on, albeit virtually. It's an interesting time at the moment. Yes. And um, before we get into everything, how are you doing? Are you okay? Yeah, we're doing fine. We're uh, yeah. quarantined just like everyone else. And I was, we were talking earlier, I just had my third kid. So uh, not a bad time to be stuck at home because yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't have been doing much anyway. So. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it couldn't have been a better time, which is also is really good. And you're in Chicago, yeah? Yeah, I'm in Chicago. So Okay, yeah. awesome. So it's raining in Chicago. And as you said before, and in London, it's sunny, which makes no sense, but hey ho, <laughs> anyway. So firstly, for those of you that don't know who Help Scout is, can you tell us who you are and what you do? Yeah, uh, so Help Scout was founded about uh, nine years ago, I believe. Um, so it is a customer success kind of platform. So it helps uh, manage shares, inboxes, mm -hmm. uh, all different kinds of workflows, mostly geared towards small businesses. Um, and so, you know, it's a 100% remote company. Um, so uh, before everyone had to be remote. Um, and so we have about 100 employees scattered through about 75 different cities uh, wow. that all, all work on the product together. So, yeah. Yeah, when I was looking at you guys online, and of course, I'd heard of Help Scout before, but um, it was crazy in terms of seeing that you, you've been remote since, well, since ever, since inception. It's insane. I'll delve into that in a little bit. But yep. Before we get into this, I'd love to hear more about your marketing experience. Now, you've been in marketing for over 16 years, and that is insane. You've still got a smile on your face, as I said before. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's madness. <laughs> Can you explain a bit more about your journey and what excites you the most about marketing? Yeah. Um, so marketing when I first started was a lot different uh, than it is today. I think the, the thing that's most exciting to me is, is really the technology. Uh, you know, 16 years ago, there wasn't even really a, like marketing automation. Um, that was just kind of coming around. And you think about like where that's come to from now and the level of personalization you can actually provide uh, and just the smart different ways you can market. Uh, but so I think the technology advancements have been the thing that's been like super interesting in, in the marketing, marketing world. You look at that, you know, what is it? whatever it's up to now, that MarTech 8,000, mm. 9,000, whatever of those tech companies that just didn't exist before. Um, but within that, I think like the core principles of marketing have stayed kind of the same, right? Of just mm. being like personalized, adding like a lot of value. Like, so I think the fundamental core concepts seeing that work across like all the technology advancements has been pretty interesting. It's crazy to envision a world without marketing automation before it started <laughs> as well, and to have experienced the evolution. That's really, really cool. So I'd love to, to hear from you because it's been, it's been a while. So over your time, you must have accumulated a ton of learnings and lessons. And I'd love you to be able to share with all of our listeners and viewers your top three lessons that you've learned over the years. Yeah. <clears throat> so I think top three would probably all fall under like one big lesson, which is like, I think um, one is just shipping a lot of things right in marketing i think there's sometimes there's this wait until it's the perfect campaign or the perfect thing to try and marketers can spend months trying to develop these campaigns and and i think we have the benefit now of like you can test things so rapidly um so i think it's you should be shipping a lot of things in marketing to find out the one thing that's right right uh mm -hmm. and then i guess that leads me to kind of the second lesson which is like most of what you launch is actually not going to be right, right? Like most of what you try is probably not going to work the first time you try it. So I think it's that evolution of like the quicker you can find those failures, the quicker you get to success. Um, whether yeah. it be an email campaign, a subject line, what, whatever it is you're working on, an ad creative, um, you just need to get it out in the wild yeah. sooner rather than later for waiting for that moment. Um, and then I think like your best assumptions are probably wrong too, right? And so a lot of times you think you know your customers and you know the campaign that'll resonate. I can't tell you the amount of times we've launched something and like an A-B test and like, I'm like, oh, this is, why are we even testing this? This is clearly gonna be the winning version and then it's not, right? And so 
I think it's just getting more and more stuff out into the wild to test rapidly and, and, and like I said, learn, learn faster. So just ship it. Like that is the key takeaway. Just get it out there and then you can start to see because it could be completely different to your expectations. Yeah. And I think it's a nice thing with all the technology and stuff we have today and all the different channels, like you can pull together things pretty rapidly, right? Mm. Like you can use Canva to pull together like a creative that you want to test pretty rapidly without having to go through a design team and all that sort of stuff to just test to see if it works before you can yeah. make this a big broad campaign. Yeah, 100%. Okay, cool. That's a really, that's some really good lessons and I'm sure you'll help some marketers take upon and avoid things through that. So I want to talk about um, and your experience. I'm sure you in the hiring process a number of times over the years. So I'd love to understand what's the most important quality that you're looking for when you're looking for a new marketing hire? Yeah, so um, I think one of the big things I look for is someone who kind of along the same vein of what I just answered is is a constant learner and wants to try a lot of different things. Um, and so I think, you know, sometimes marketers are in the job and they're, they just get very like narrow focus on what they're doing. And, and, and they don't think of like, what are all the big creative things we could be doing? So mm. I think someone who's got that balance of like can execute, but also thinks bigger ideas. And so like one of the questions I always ask was, um, you know, basically like if your CEO tomorrow or your CMO tomorrow turned around and said like, okay, you have a million dollars to spend now. We just, you know, got some crazy million dollar budget. Like where would you allocate those funds in your role today? Mm. Um, and it's kind of telling because if they haven't taken the time to think through like how they would do that or like what are some of the big campaigns they would want want to run in an ideal world if they had the budget or they had the time or the resources and they're not doing that at their job today, like why would you expect them to do it when they work for you, right? They probably, yeah. right? So like if you can't, like if I turned to you and said like, hey, if I give you a million dollars, like how would you promote the show? You could probably talk for an hour about like, oh, we'd launch these campaigns on LinkedIn. I'd hire these influencers, like whatever you're thinking, right? But at least you would have thoughts behind it. Mm-hmm. And so when you get very like basic answers from that question, that's always a big red flag for me of like, okay, they're not thinking like big enough or, or willing to push the envelope. So think bigger. Everyone <clears throat> needs to. What's the what's the um, key question that you've asked someone when you're in that interview, asking them to think in a task? What what is that question you ask them? So I mean, it's the question is basically, yeah. If your CEO turned around and gave you a million dollars in in additional budget today, basically, I'll walk through like what are their goals, Mm. and then the follow up question is like, if your CEO turned around and gave you a million dollars to go achieve those goals, like what would you do differently than what you're doing today? Um, And sometimes you get really good answers out of that, and sometimes you get just very generic, like, oh, I'd spend more money on AdWords. (laughs) <laughs> okay that's kind of a boring Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah that's awesome that's really cool so I, I wanted to transition into um some of your impressive work history <laughs> under your belt over the years you've led all growth marketing globally at what was g2 crowd now g2 and they really do lead the way for customer satisfaction as we know ourselves but for those who are listening that might not know what they do could you share a little bit more about what they're doing over there. Yeah, so G2 is, uh, it's the world's like software, largest software review site. So, uh, and that's a very basic way to put it. Um, You know, it's where people are going to make buying decisions. They get about 6 million people a month going there to read reviews on different software for their businesses. So it could be marketing tech, it could be sales software, it could be anything, right? Um, And so uh, they've done an amazing job building up a brand and then recognizing the people who are successful because the reality is like people don't want to hear from uh, a company telling you how great they are. Every company says how great they are, right? They want to read actual reviews the same way you consume a product and you would go on Amazon. You're not buying a product without reading the reviews on it first on Amazon, right? If you're going to buy a cooler or something like that. Same thing with like B2B software. And so I think they've provided that, that ecosystem and really built that up in a huge way. 100%. 100%. Like I know myself, I've, I've been there filling out reviews within G2 before. They have a certain knack for bringing people in to be able to want to give feedback on the tools they're using, which is really cool. So, yeah, really awesome things that they're doing there. I think they actually just um, opened up last year in the UK as well, an office down here. So we've seen okay. them talk. Yeah, yeah. We've seen them talk a couple of times. So okay, that's really, nice. really cool. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. So I'd, I'd love to talk a bit more about your time there. And I'd love to first delve into 
what were the top three demand and tactics that worked for you at G2? Yeah, so um, at G2, one of the fun things and one of the hard things about working there was you market the marketers, right? And so mm -hmm. they, they, like I'm going after most of the times so it was a demand gen leader or a CMO who signed the contract. So the bar was kind of high in terms of like the marketing you put in front of them. So a lot of times we get feedback on like emails we sent or ad campaigns from like other <laughs> marketers. So, um, but it made it kind of fun because like, a big game was kind of like how do you cut through the noise with those people because they see everything and they're doing everything on their end so um i would say like when you're marketing to marketers is how do you stand out from the crowd and re really marketing to anyone because like they get so much of the same stuff so we really tried to view things differently and tried a lot of different random techniques um we've sent pinata grams to people where we actually delivered a real pinata at their desk um and the messaging <laughs> the mess <laughs> the messaging was pretty much like beating this cute pinata is not nearly as fun as beating your competition on G2, like get reviews. That's amazing. <laughs> uh, we So we found like direct mail worked really well for us there uh, because like you don't get a lot of mail as, as a marketer today, right? Um, and the direct mail you do get a lot of times is just kind of boring, like, you know, here's a box of cookies kind of thing. And so we tried I to do like things you. that stood yeah, out. That's, that's insane. I was just going to jump in. I thought pinatagram was some some graph or some terminology or something but no, no, no sending no. an actual pinata wow yes. <laughs> we've also sent uh pennies to people um and with just creative messaging so it was i think those types of campaigns we saw good success with and then on the like other thing we did is you know the interesting thing about g2 is we have data on your company whether you're a customer or not um so if you think about it um like you have a profile on G2 as a company and, and you're yeah. getting reviews, whether you're engaging with us or not. So we have all this data around like what's happening in that buyer experience and buyer intent data. And so delivering super personalized email campaigns to a CMO of like, hey, like here's who's actually looking at your profile and comparing you against these competitors. It's like, do you want a free data tour? It worked really well for us. That's awesome. It's so creative as well. And like you said, the, the data you have to hand is so valuable there. Really, really cool. So I'd love to understand what role really did your having a unified Martech stack play in your campaigns and your outreach throughout your time there? Could you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah. So um, obviously, I think like every company has got its... Uh, Martech, Martech stack issues, right? Of like certain systems not talking to other ones. So G2 is not immune to that. Um, you know, I think when we looked at it, we kind of had two ecosystems in a way. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so it was super important, the marrying of that data. Um, so we had basically like customers and prospects we were going after, but we also had, you know, over a million people who have left reviews. So we have this review community as well. So, uh, and just because you're in one doesn't mean you're in the other. So you could be a prospect talking to us, but also leaving reviews about the software you're using on there. So mm -hmm. I think using a CDP and being really balanced and smart about like how we're having people communicate and understanding what's happening across all these different touch points of like their interactions with G2 was was pretty critical for us. And there were definitely some things we were still working through to get that right. But I think like having all the systems talk to each other was was super critical for us. That's, that's awesome. And that's interesting that you actually touched on CDPs because it's what I wanted to talk a little bit more about now. I'd love to understand what's your take on CDPs and what and how did you use it within your operation days during your time at G2? Yeah, so I think when you think of it um, and the value of it, it's it, it's not for every company, right? I think mm -hmm. certain smaller companies, um, depending on how many different systems you have, like a lot of companies can get by with you know one market automation system that has houses a lot of that data and can be kind of smart about it. Um, once you want to start pulling in product data. Uh, and different touch points you're getting across all the different things, having that central spot to run campaigns out of and pull data out of to say like, who is the right segment? If I wanna go after like admins of G2 profiles who have logged in in the last four months, but also haven't left a review and haven't been hit with these emails, like there's no great way if I didn't have a CDP to actually pull that data. It's literally like three different Excel reports I download out of systems, um, you know, run a, a VLOOKUP, try to, you know, do all kinds of crazy stuff in Excel that I, I'm not able to do. Um, 
and then pull out the data and then try to upload it. And by the time we get that up back uploaded, like it could have shifted and changed, right? And it's also, I can't set that up in a recurring way. So yeah. there's no way for me to actually like set up recurring campaigns. It's very one-off. And so, um, so I think that's what we found ourselves doing a lot before having a CDP. That's, that's crazy as well, like you said, like to be able to maintain that data would be so challenging for it to go back and forth. Yep. It's uh, interesting. It's it's almost like what would have happened 10 years back, like you were saying on before the times of marketing <laughs> automation. Yes. <laughs> so I'd love to understand, you know, customer intent data is really synonymous with G2. And I'd love to touch on understanding how do you see B2B companies really adopting this information moving forwards? Yeah, so I think there's the obvious use case of intent data and sales outreach, right? Which is like, hey, this person's actually researching reviews on our software, someone should reach out to them. Like, I think that's like the most basic form of stuff you should be doing. Um, I think where it starts to get really interesting um, is kind of creating that loop, right? Where like, if you think about your marketing dollars and what you're spending, um, most SaaS offerings are one year contracts, right? Um, mm. And so you go out and you build a campaign on LinkedIn and you want to target, let's just say, you know, VPs of, of demand gen and you build out that profile and your marketing automation system and you go after and run campaigns against that. You have no idea if I just signed a contract a month ago or two weeks ago or yesterday with one of your biggest competitors and you're going to spend to advertise to me for the next year or so because I fit the right criteria of like, I'm at a company this size and I have the right title, right? And so marketers do this all the time and think about the wasted spend that's actually happening there, right? Whereas like if you could actually use intent data and feed it into your ad systems and your campaigns you're running, like now you're actually like targeting people who are in market. Mm. Uh, it's not a perfect science either, but it's it's way better than I think some of the, the spilled milk you have of just like broadly running campaigns. Um, and so I think you can use that in like your LinkedIn advertising, uh, if Facebook advertising, you can use a lot of different things to get like really tailored audiences that are, you know are further down the funnel. So if you're just getting like intent data on the category, uh, maybe that's more brand awareness plays because you know they're searching in the category, maybe not specifically you. If it's specifically you, I think you can be a little more aggressive of more down the funnel type of campaigns that you can run against that audience. That's awesome. That, that was so much information there. That's really, really cool. And yeah, it's, it's really interesting to see how you can use that to even take it a level further to dictate the different messaging that would occur within the retargeting on Facebook and whatnot. I've seen this hyper localized campaigns across different companies where they actually can switch out the type of company name that's actually occurring within the ad to speak to that individual, which yeah. is just crazy. It's taking it that next step further. Yeah. Yeah, and if you think about it too, like I think also using those customer reviews, and it's not necessarily just intent data, but like Drift does an amazing job. Mm -hmm. um, they've got a page up, I think it's like Drift versus Intercom. And it's basically like just using customer reviews to tell the story of why they think they're better than Intercom. And it's not them saying it, it's their customers saying it, right? And so they use that in like paid ad campaigns uh, for like competitor campaigns as well. So I think there's a lot of like use cases of just kind of creating that that feedback loop of like, you know, someone was on G2 reading reviews. Well, don't then serve the reviews back up to them and tell them why you're the best at what you're doing. So, um, And what's your favorite format of content at the moment in this quarter? Everything's changed at the moment, the way that people are really digesting everything. Yep. But yeah. Uh, I mean, we're seeing like more and more like virtual events. So we've been doing webinars and stuff around like the work from home thing. Um, mm -hmm. Just because like we have like it's 100% remote company and it has been for the last eight years. So we have a lot of expertise on like how to set those processes up and build it out. So um, I would say that's one of the big areas where we've seen a lot of content engagement today. Yeah, 100%. It's almost like repackaging the way that someone was once doing a webinar to this new way of doing things through a virtual summit. It's a I think it's really disruptive. It's uh, just right now becoming bigger and bigger. It's going to be a really interesting evolution there. Yeah. And more recently, as we touched on before, so you're now at Help Scout. And like you said, it's been remote for over eight years. It's insane. So I'd love to move into talking about what's going on over there. So you joined a couple of months back, which is really, really exciting. And congratulations on making that move. So 
of course, your remote first, but have you met your team in person? And first, yeah, I'd love to understand, did you get to meet your team before this yeah. happens? So I, I did not. Um, so I, well, I, I met our CEO in, in person. Um, so um, prior to joining, I flew out to Colorado and spent a couple of days with him. So I got to meet him mm -hmm. and one person on my team, as well as one of our other co-founders. Uh, so I got to spend a little bit of time with some people on the team. Um, but then after that, this was like right before all the craziness started yeah. happening and everything got locked down. So um, since then, no, it's all been virtual. Uh, they usually do traditionally a in-person onboarding where they'll mm. fly you into like Boston or Colorado where we have like a group of people and they'll fly in a few team members just cause, so you feel that interaction like face to face uh, for the first week or so, but then it's hundred percent remote from there. So that's, that's so cool. And yeah, as I said, I was reading online and there's just a ton around you guys doing remote, which is fantastic. So how does it feel to run a new team and be involved in this new team remotely since day one? I'd love to know about that. Yeah, it's been like, I, I mean, I mean, look, like we're having this conversation now. So yeah. we're going to walk out of here feeling like, hey, I feel like I know Noah a little bit better, right? So like, I think the face-to-face -face communication, you know, via Zoom and all these different platforms has gotten so good and the quality of the video is so high now that it, it replicates a lot of that that experience. So it hasn't mm -hmm. been as like drastic of an adjustment, I think, as anything. I think where it gets tricky is having like team meetings and things like that, um, that are just a little bit different. Um, but overall, I mean, it's been fine. I, I, there hasn't been like too much of a shock to my world um, by mm -hmm. managing a team that's 100% remote. So. And th that's really interesting. Like you say, yeah, everything is so averse these days that you get all of these interactions. As you said, it's, it's feel, it feels like I know you a little bit better now. Um, how do you find with, say, when you're collaborating, you're starting a new campaign or you're reviewing a course's efforts, how do you feel like that dynamic works remotely? Because you miss the things like whiteboards. And I know it sounds like an ancient thing, but I love going onto a whiteboard and reviewing what's happened and looking almost in a retro style perspective. Yeah, um, so we use Asana um, almost as like yeah, a whiteboarding yeah. kind of thing. Um, so just setting it up in that board kind of Trello fashion uh, yeah, yeah. To, to kind of replicate that experience, I think a little bit. Um, but yeah, I think you do miss on the whiteboard. I'm still writing on post-it notes and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, I've got them as well. <laughs> well. Um, so I think there is like elements of that. Um, but I think like kicking off those creative campaigns, I think it, 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 you can still do those brainstorming type sessions, mm. I think on a call uh, just as easily. I think it's more emphasis on like note taking and, and yeah. the communication of like the written communication and follow-ups are super important there. You know, and you're, you're right, 100%. It's about like having everything tied into like Notion or something, but then also once you overcome the hurdle of having to do a whiteboard session remotely, you figure it out and then you learn how to do it. And I've done it from the likes of a proposal through to planning a campaign. And yeah, it, it works. There's, there's Miro and Loom becomes your best friend, which is I'm grateful for to be able to go through, just make videos and whatnot. Yep. So yeah, it's really exciting. Yeah, definitely. It paves the new way for the, for the, well, for you, you've always been working that way, but yeah. <laughs> well, I, I personally have not been, but yeah, right. but the but company yeah. has, yeah, so. It helps, yeah. 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 So I, I'd love to un, un, really uncover what's going on under the hood at Help Scout. So can you walk us through the tools in your MarTech stack at the moment? Yeah, um, so we're using HubSpot um, as our main kind of marketing automation system. We have Salesforce as our CRM. Um, we run pretty light in terms of like a marketing tech stack, to be honest with you. Um, you know, we've got some web tracking tools and stuff like that, Ahrefs and stuff. Uh, but we're not using like crazy like ABM tools or anything like that. Like um, ABM is not really the play for us uh, mm -hmm. going after like small businesses. Um, so we're pretty light uh, in terms of like what we actually use from a tech stack po point of view. That's awesome, man. The, yeah, like it, it just really, like you say, it depends on the size. Because when you're going off those enterprise, you can use those different elements and tooling to dictate what you would get between the sales and the marketing team. How do yep. you do that between sales and marketing? Is it just syncing through HubSpot? Yeah, so HubSpot and the Salesforce. Um, and then we are actually... Um, about 90% of our sales actually come self-serve. Um, okay. So uh, we have a small sales team, um, uh, less than 10 people on the team. Um, 
whereas like G2 had 100 something. So uh, definitely a, a different model in terms of well, what we're trying to do here. So we have a lot, most of our like smaller size companies, like where it's less than 10 users, all go just through the self-serve model, right? We have a 90 day trial. So um, they'll do a trial and then just convert through there. So um, a lot of the communication and conversion stuff happens like through HubSpot. That's, that's really, really awesome. And you, um, what would you say is the sweet spot of when you feel, so what stage within the trial do you often notice in terms of timing someone converts to paid? Yeah, um, so the interesting thing is like, <laughs> my, it, I'm in like the wild west in terms of like data right now because we switched yeah. to a 90 day trial because of uh, COVID to give people more time to like, use the software and stuff like that. So it was traditionally a, a 14 day trial. Um, so like the data since I've joined has just been like, we're just getting people coming out of the trials because I've been there for about 90 days almost. So, um, so I'm definitely in this weird world where like, it was an odd time to switch jobs. <laughs> um, <laughs> so none of the data is like normal right now. So I don't have a great read on that. We do do a trial score. We have a great like data team. Um, and so we do a trial score based off of different activity, like how often they're logging in, what activities are they actually doing? Uh, did they set this up, set that up? And then it kind of rolls up a score. So we measure that in terms of like the likelihood someone's gonna convert based off their trial score. Um, so that's what kind of the North Star metric Actually, that's, that's really interesting. And uh, yeah, thanks for clarifying that. And that's, yeah, crazy to think that I'm hearing from a ton of companies at the moment that they're transitioning towards that longevity and that longer term trialing. And it makes sense as well yeah. as holding the people that you have with you very close to keep those advocates close to your chest. And yeah. I'd, I'd love to understand in your opinion right now, I know you haven't had too long to look at the data, but what would be for you, I guess, the go-to channel currently to acquire new customers for Help Scout? Yeah, um, so right now our biggest channel, uh, we get a lot through just organic and through a lot of our content uh, signing mm -hmm. up. Um, the company's got a really strong background in content. Uh, we also do some paid search. Um, we're not really successful here yet, so this is gonna be what I'm gonna say is gonna be our biggest channel, and I have basis off of nothing, so I'll take that. So like I said earlier, start of the conversation, I'm probably gonna be wrong here, but to me, I feel like Facebook is where still, like we serve a lot of uh, consumer good type companies, um, mm. a lot of e-commerce type shops, right? And so a lot of those types of businesses are, are run a lot through Facebook, right? And so in my past, when I've targeted small businesses, you know, they're not really on LinkedIn necessarily. They might yeah. have a profile, but that's not their go-to spot. That's more of like a SaaS sales and marketing world, I feel like, than, than anything else. So I think Facebook is the channel that I feel the strongest about will be one of our best channels. Um, and so that's where we're going to be focusing some of our efforts going forward. That's, that's really interesting. So you'll be leveraging your content and then accessing it and distributing it through Facebook to yeah. be able to try and locate those e-commerce type and the smaller term businesses, which is really, really cool. I think there's a lot of people and a lot of businesses within that space hanging out, conversing in communities as well, which is almost not untouched, but it's a way which Facebook is really paving towards as a future for Facebook. And I'm seeing that I have a community as well. So it's really interesting. Being yeah. Touched on. Yeah. Yeah. And I'd love to end on one last question that we ask all of our guests that have come onto the show. So as, as being at Help Scout right now, I'd love to really just understand what is that one metric that you give the most importance to? If you could pick one metric that you really ultimately would love the most, what is that one that you would love to share with everyone today? Um, yeah, so for us, it's, I mean, we look at revenue to be honest with you. like it's how many how many trials are converting like i mean there's a lot of numbers that lead up to that like how many trials are getting started right like um and like and the conversion percentage but like ultimately like we care about the revenue that that's coming through those trials right and so i think looking at that that trial conversion rate and like understanding how trials are converting mm. move that piece is huge for us um so at the end of the day, it's kind of like a CAC to LTV metric is probably like the North Star because that tells me how much I can spend uh, to go out and acquire someone. It tells me like how long people are staying with us. So I would say like CAC to LTV is, is probably our big metric. 
Okay, cool. So character LTV, and like you say, it dictates. It really dictates everything. It's the heart of the company, and it makes perfect sense in terms of engaging with anything to be able to see the ROI moving forward is super, super important. Yeah, and that's I just also just got off with our CFO right before this call, so <laughs> that's probably also why <laughs> it's ingrained in my head. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, marketing experiments. No, <laughs> show <laughs> us, show us the ROI. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. And it has been a pleasure speaking to you. That's all we have time for today. Thank you so much for coming on to the show, Adam. It's yeah, thank great. you for having me on. I enjoyed it. Thank you, and I hope that you and everyone else will be able to really you provide fantastic lessons. So everyone else, I hope, will be able to away some great learnings from this, from this episode and don't forget to share and like this episode for everyone that is listening and watching right now and thank you so much it's been a pleasure thanks now all right see you, see you. bye